if you have glenoid bone loss in addition to your hill sacs bone loss, the hill sacs is going to engage more easily. And uh, we know too that you can treat an engaging hill sacs on the humeral side just by treating the glenoid side. You can always get a graft, whether it's iliac or coracoid, that's long enough that you lengthen the articular arc of the uh, glenoid so much that the hill sacs can't engage. Um, in general, we've used this uh, number of 25%, greater than 25% loss of the inferior glenoid diameter as the indication we're doing a ladder J. And when you do the ladder J, I have yet, you stabilize it so much, I have yet to find a patient that needs to have the humerus uh, additionally addressed, that you just do the ladder J, work on the glenoid side, and your heel sex is not going to engage. And I think the reason for this is because it's not only the articular arc, but it's the sling effect of the conjoint tendon where you have this posteriorly directed force when you bring the arm into abduction external rotation. So there again, you can address the glenoid and humeral bone defects with a glenoid-based graft only. Of course, you can treat the heel sacs by remplissage, where you make the heel sacs extra articular. You're putting your uh, infraspinatus uh, tendon and the ca underlying capsule into that heel sacs defect. Um, uh, until fairly recently, there weren't really good indications. There were no good objective criteria for when you would do a remplissage. And the idea was if you had glenoid bone loss less than 25%, you could probably do well with uh, an arthroscopic procedure. But when would you add the remplissage? Well, the, the general answer was if you had a large hill sex, but how large is large? So um, this whole concept of the glenoid track actually gave us a, a new tool for evaluating the, uh, the hill sacs. And if you haven't read this article, you should do this, Yamamoto, Itoi, and Associates, 2007. And if you think of the uh, glenoid as being an ink blotter, if, you, if it were covered with ink, as you bring the arm into abduction external rotation all the way overhead, it would form a track from the ink on its uh, surface along the humerus, and that's what the glenoid track is. Uh, we decided, uh, I was actually Giovanni Di Giacomo put us all together to Itoi and myself and uh, uh, to go ahead and, and collaborate on this concept of incorporating the glenoid track into this whole concept of engaging and non-engaging hill sacs. And we came up with this on-track, off-track concept. If you go back to the uh, cadaver study by Yamamoto and Itoi, uh, you see that the glenoid pushes the, po the cuff posteriorly 17% of the glenoid width, and that's why the glenoid track is not 100% of the glenoid width. It's only 83%. You see how the posterior glenoid pushes the cuff more posteriorly. Um, so if you have some glenoid bone loss, as you would have with a bony bank art, or either acute or attritional, you'll have a glenoid track that is even less. You'll have to subtract the width of that glenoid defect from the 83% of the normal glenoid width. So this is your key formula then. 83% uh, of big D, which is the glenoid diameter, minus little d, which is your glenoid defect. So you can come up with a number for the glenoid track. You also need to measure the hill sacs interval. What is that? That's the width of the hill sacs lesion plus the width of what we call the bone bridge, which is the bone between the uh, lateral aspect of the hill sacs and the capsular attachment of the rotator cuff. So uh, this is the key then in deciding if a hill sacs lesion is on track or off track. If your hill sacs interval is less than the glenoid track, it's on track, it's not going to engage. If the uh, hill sacs interval is greater than the glenoid track, it's an off track lesion and it will engage. There's some radiographic techniques that have been proposed. There's this perfect circle technique. Uh, Dr. Itoi has a great lecture where he talks, though, about it's not such a perfect circle because you can usually find two or three circles that seem to be perfect, and then that can vary by as much as three or four millimeters. But it, assuming you use this, you can then uh, uh, calculate both big D and little d from this perfect, perfect circle technique. And then you can template this glenoid track onto the humerus of a 3D CT scan and see if the hill sacs is going to engage. The problem with this, I don't think it's very accurate because you really can't uh, 
you can't accurately delineate that uh, ridge on the greater tuberosity where the capsule attaches within about three or four millimeters. So I think there's a lot of error in doing it this way. Uh, Tokish came up with another method using an MRI technique, and this um, depends on getting a parasagittal cut. And if you look at enough MRIs, you'll see most of them don't get you this perfect parasagittal cut to measure big D little d. Once again, you're dependent on this perfect or imperfect circle technique. But the good thing about this technique is you can get an accurate distance of this hill sac interval because you can see where the cuff attachments are, unlike on a 3D CT scan. Once again, this is the, the key, is if the heel-sac interval is less than the glenoid track, it's on track. If it's greater than the glenoid track, it's off track. So then you, we've developed a treatment paradigm based on three groups. Group one was where the glenoid defect is less than 25%. So if the glenoid defect is less than 25%, typically you can do an arthroscopic uh, uh, procedure. But if it's less than 25% plus you have an on-track heel sacs, all you need is an arthroscopic bank heart repair. Group two would be a glenoid defect less than 25% plus an off-track heel sacs. And uh, then you do an arthroscopic bank heart repair, but add a remplissage to that. And then group three, if you have a glenoid defect greater than or equal to 25%, you should do a ladder J. My preferred technique actually is arthroscopic. And if I'm going to, even, even if I think I'm going to do a ladder J, I'll scope uh, the shoulder first just to get uh, very precise measurements uh, because I think that the radiographic techniques underestimate the number of off-track hill sacs lesions. So here's the way I do it is uh, basically the, the, uh, the bare spot of the glenoid is approximately, it's not exactly, but approximately in the middle of the uh, inferior glenoid. So you, uh, the only erosion you're going to have with anterior instability is anteriorly so that the posterior radius is going to be a normal radius. So you Measure from the bare spot to the posterior rim of the glenoid, multiply that times two, that's your diameter. So you're just looking from natural superior portal. Here's our bare spot. And these hash marks are five millimeters apart. So we've got 15 millimeters toward the front, 10 millimeters, or 15 millimeters to the back, 10 millimeters to the front. So uh, you see it here in the still, you see 15 millimeters is our radius. And then the anterior radius we've measured is only 10 millimeters, so you've got about five millimeters of bone loss there. So little d is gonna be five millimeters in this case. So then you can just calculate this glenoid tract, just plug in the numbers. You know, it's like I've told so many people, it's not calculus, it's arithmetic. So you can do this just right there on your back table, 83% of big D, in this case the 30 minus little d, which is five, and you come up with a glenoid tract that's 19.9 millimeters in width. Then you'll measure the uh, hill sacs interval. So you first start out measuring the width of the hill sacs itself, and then you measure the bone bridge between the cuff and the hill sacs. And you add those together, that's your hill sacs interval. So arthroscopically, this is a left shoulder, anterior superior portal, so the end of that probe is four millimeters in uh, length, in length, so basically we've got three uh, diameters of that, both for the bone bridge and then another three diameters for the hill sacs. So we've got 12 millimeters for the hill sacs, 12 millimeters for the uh, bone bridge, so a total of 24 millimeters for our hill sacs interval. So 24 millimeters is the hill sacs interval. It's greater than the glenoid track. So uh, therefore, this is an off-track or an engaging type of a hill sac lesion. So that means in terms of treatment, uh, we would do an arthroscopic bank repair plus add a remplissage to that. Um, various techniques, and you can try some of these in the lab today. The standard one we started out with was this double pulley, double mattress technique. You've got to clear the subcranial space far posteriorly. These ring curettes, no matter what technique you use, are really good to repair the bone bed. And then you repair it all the way over to the cuff attachments, which means on that bone uh, bridge, you've got to take all the soft tissue off. Two anchors at the medial edge of the hill sacs. Typically, you want to uh, retrieve these sutures trans tendon, but come in at about a 45 degree angle of approach because you want to come through tendon, not through muscle. 
And so then you're up in the subacromial space, which you have to pre-clear out the, the uh, subacromial space before you pull those sutures through, or else you have to do like Paul showed and leave your uh, guide over the top of that. But you've got to clear the subacromial space, then you do this double pulley technique to end up with a double mattress over the top. And so you can end up with this very uh, uh, satisfying picture of just pulling the uh, soft tissue into that defect and making the defect extra articular. There's an interesting uh, and, and quick way to do the, uh, this knotless remplissage with these self-cinching uh, knotless anchors, either the knotless suture tack or knotless corkscrew, depending on the quality of your bone. And what you're doing, let's see, let's go back. What you're doing is you're taking the working suture of one anchor and passing it through the splice of the opposite anchor and vice versa. So basically you end up with a knotless double mattress that way. So here's a case of a 41-year-old man. He had uh, three anterior dislocations, 12% glenoid bone loss, and an off-track hill sacs. He's got an ALPSA here too. That did this uh, actually a few years ago, and, one, and he had a slap. So in the case of a slap, we'll repair that. <clears throat> Preparing our um, hill sacs here in this left shoulder with the curettes. And before fixing the bank art, you want to place these anchors back uh, posteriorly in the hill sacks, otherwise you can disrupt your bank art repair. In this case, this was an ALPSA lesion. I wanted double loaded anchors. My only choices then were um, the uh, knotted type. So we fixed that and now we're, see I'm coming in at a 45 degree angle to pull those sutures out. And then I'm gonna thread um, the working suture of one anchor through the splice of the other anchor and then vice versa. So that gives me a knotless double mattress and you see how now that brings it down, and that's a very quick procedure, much quicker than if you do the double mattress. And here's the guy at two years post-op. People always worry about uh, loss of external rotation, and you know, in some people you'll see a little bit. I've not seen it be a problem um, where it's a significant amount of stiffness. It was, so this was his left shoulder. Uh, the on-track, off-track paradigm, um, again, Tokish's group has looked at this uh, to clinically uh, validate this paradigm with anterior glenohumeral instability. They had 57 patients who had all had an arthroscopic bank art repair only. Uh, they found that um, uh, on their on-track, uh, within their on-track group, they had an 8.2% failure rate. Within their off-track Hill Sachs group, they had a 75% failure rate. And in the 47 patients that remained stable, only 4.3% were off track. So they concluded that off track bipolar bone loss was a significant predictor of failure after isolated bank art repair, correctly predicting failure in 75% of cases. So consider this. Here again is the um, treatment paradigm group one, um, glenoid defect less than 25% plus an on track ill sacs, doing arthroscopic bank art repair alone. Group two, glenoid defect less than 25% plus an off-track hill sacs, add a remplissage to your arthroscopic bank cart. And then group three, if you have a glenoid defect greater than or equal to 25%, do a ladder shake. 